Okay. Astrid, what time is it there? Can I ask? You're muted. Um, so it's uh, now one minute past six in the evening. Okay, six hours. Okay. okay. Yeah, so it's, it's nice for me. It's, uh, it's a <laughs> working day. So uh, that's good. Yeah. So we'll wait a couple more minutes um, and. I might have at least uh, the attendings or actually I'll, I'll be asking who some of the the attend the attendants are because um, there's some some names I don't always recognize. Um, and I'm going to make sure JD is going to call in. He just texted. Oops. Oh, he's he's looking for the best internet connection because he's on his laptop. I think he's on vacation right now. So, um, he uh, I was I was very impressed that he still wanted to teach, <laughs> teach uh, or to participate in these. Yeah. So uh, uh, we have Panther is, is Aggie. Do you want me to change your name, Agnes? I can change it if you want me to, or if you want me to be, okay, you want me to change it? I think I'm allowed to do that as the host. That's really funny. More, assign rename. Okay, if anybody else needs me to change their name, let me know. Um, okay, we're getting, uh, George, is that Dr. Lee's? You're muted if it is. He might just still be calling in. Yeah, I'm here. Ah, it's good to hear your voice, George. Um, okay, so as we're still waiting for JD to find his best internet connection, um, I will just kind of kick these off because I know we have some new attendees. Um, uh, this was on hiatus for maybe three or four months, unfortunately, um, because of uh, obviously the events that have happened in 2020. Um, and uh, most of us were um, teaching pretty much entirely online the entire um, two months um, for, I don't know, six to seven hours a day. So um, we uh, delayed these rounds. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we can get back on schedule. Um, the purpose of these rounds for people who are new is we usually do about one to two cases per um, session. This is a group of clinicians um, and um, some pathologists um, and pathology residents. So uh, there are times where a lot of the clinicians will probably be leading the discussion and talking about treatment or how they would have worked it up. Um, and then there'll be times where I'll be showing some pathology. Um, and uh, some of it is kind of to illustrate to the clinicians why we lead for a diagnosis versus of one type versus another. Um, and then um, sometimes I like to quiz the pathology residents. So you can see me every so often throw out a question to the pathology residents to say, hey, what would you, what would you think this lesion is? Um, so uh, don't be surprised if I call on you guys. Um, I have my first year residents here, um, at least two of my first year residents, the other one's on the floor. Um, and so that's Dr. Miller and Dr. Lind. And then um, we have a couple of the clinical pathologists that are also on this group too. Um, from OSU. So I think Nina Randolph, Dr. Randolph might be here as well. Um, we have uh, Mary Nabity, who is a clinical pathologist, uh, Jessica Hocamp, who is a clinical pathologist, and she's on, I think they're in a group in one room. Um, and let's see, we have a few uh, nephrology-focused clinicians. So Dr. Vaden, who it looks like she's on the 
some gorgeous Mediterranean coast right now. <laughs> um, we, have, we have Astrid um, and she is uh, one of our uh, main contacts for the European Veterinary Renal Pathology Service. Um, and then I guess if I, if, if ever, um, oh, Dr. Lee is, excuse me. Um, so he is the, basically the initiator of renal pathology in uh, my lifetime, um, as far as being able to do the advanced diagnostics in a routine manner. They had been done previously. It's just that he was the one that made it happen um, in a good turnaround time. And so I owe pretty much all of the, the uh, ability to do these diagnostics to his initiative. Um, goodness gracious. JD has still has not found his great internet connection. Oh, he's just texted me again and he said public Wi-Fi is not reliable. Okay, so in the interest of time, this is recorded. Um, uh, would so I Tanner, I got your email. You're from NC State. Um, I, I, is that correct? And if you are muted or don't have access to um, microphone, you can type in the chat. Um, you're an NC State resident, I think. Hi, yeah, NC State resident. Thanks for okay. letting us join. You're welcome. And I think I have put you through all of the invites. I think I sent you all the invites. And the, I know there are other NC State residents that would like to. So if you just send me your email, um, I can put you and you'll be able to accept all of the invites. Okay. Um, Dr. Wolf um, is one of our reliable clients. Can you speak? Are you smoking a pipe in that picture? I'm very confused. No, hello. Hi. <laughs> Good to see your face. Good and to I see, see you your clinics. Um, yes. And we have Cedric. Cedric, you're in California, correct? Yes, I'm currently in San Diego. Okay, okay. Yeah, we've just gotten a couple of cases from you. Um, Dr. Wong is a pathology resident, soon to be pathologist um, at uh, Purdue. And uh, me. So I'm going to just go ahead and start because I know JD is going to join. Um, he's, like I said, um, and the way I'm doing this, because I'm doing this for my house, so obviously I don't have my microscope to, to broadcast everything. Um, so, um, but I'm going to go through the photos. I think that'll just be as, as, uh, um, fairly easy for us to, um, to assess. And I have, I'm going to pull up the synopsis and share it with you. Um, let's see. So, um, and Dr. Uh, Foster, if when he is able to find good internet and can join, um, he can fill in any of the gaps in the history. But this is a case that came just in um, June. Um, yes, June. And uh, we were told, let's see if I can get rid of that part there, that he was, this was a Cocker Spaniel. He's about four and a half, five years old. Um, and he's male castrated. Um, he had a UPC of 6.4, um, was also azotemic at 2.1, hypoalbuminemic, but not hypertensive. Um, and so he first um, was vomiting diarrhea about a week ago, and that's um, when they showed uh, mild azotemia at that time. Um, hypoalbuminemia and proteinuria. Um, so it sounded like for his, you know, another set of a presenting signs being, you know, GI related, they brought him into the clinics. That's when they're like, oh goodness, this dog's proteinuric. I don't think they knew that the dog had been proteinuric beforehand. Um, and so then he got reevaluated one week later um, and um, he was persistently proteinuric. Um, and I actually have a question for the clinicians. When you guys do document persistent proteinuria, how, 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 separate do those time points should, how sh separate should those time points be for persistence? Any clinicians? When, when we wrote up the um, consensus statement, it, it, we, we sort of, um, the, the, the general idea is low, lower values of proteinuria need to be uh, demonstrated repeatedly over a somewhat longer period of time than really high ones, okay? Okay. So if you have a, a UPC of 1.9 in a sick animal and it's not been before, it might need be rechecked and, and demonstrated that, that it's, you know, still uh, abnormal two weeks later. Now, if it's 7.2 and, and, and bland sentiment, um, we're good, you know, so. Okay, so a lot about the, the severity um, as a well, far as yes. part of like it. Well, the idea is if you go through, um, 
it, you know, it's not pre-renal, it's not post-renal, it's renal. Well, renal can, uh, can be physiologic or pathologic, okay? So uh, physiologic is mild and transient. Mm -hmm. So if they have a fever, something going on, you got a 1.7 or something like that, uh, you, you kind of have to walk, give it a chance to go away before you decide that it's pathologic renal proteinuria. If it's 7 or 10 or 40, uh, you know, the, the, you're pretty the, confident that uh, <laughs> sort of resolved to begin with and, and, and you don't wait two weeks because just because you only saw one UPC of 40, you know. Yeah. Well, and in, in this case, the hypoalbuminemia implies um, persistence as well. Okay. Well, yeah, that's okay. well, it strengthens the argument that, that it's serious, but that it could be GI too, see? So, you know, anyhow, that's what they did. Okay. They waited a, li a week and tested again. Tested again. Okay. So, um, and I don't know if, I'm not sure. I, I did text J JD and said for him to speak up whenever he can get online. And it looks like we have a couple more joints. Um, CLEA, I think you were from Penn because I remember that email address, or at least you trained at Penn. And I don't know who Frankie Easley is. So um, maybe another medicine um, person. The other um, piece of this is mm -hmm. that, that, that I don't remember exactly. I mean, I wrote up the synopsis. But uh, it, but th sometimes these things are are done in different practices. You yeah. Know? So uh, they, they they're thinking about it and they decide they're going to send it and then, and then it gets evaluated. The referral, sent, you know, where it's referred to and things. So the 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 spa time spacing is not necessarily f for medical reasons as opposed to procedural reasons getting right. somebody else to see it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um. So the proteinuria was persistent now, uh, and also there was some active sediment, um, but there were no casts, uh, so no tubular casts. Um, and for the anatomic pathologists that are calling in, um, so like the clinical pathologists are all, you know, fine with that. They, they talk about active sediment all the time. I think that anatomics lose that, um, that terminology almost in their mind um, about, um, um, awesome, great. Um, that lose that terminology in their mind about, okay, yeah, we know that there's an elevated UPC, but is it because the bladder is inflamed and there's a UTI or something like that? So, so that's when we talk about inactive sediment. So inactive sediment means we wouldn't have any of, um, we wouldn't have any of the white blood cells. We might have a few red blood cells, um, but that would be an inactive sediment. And so we would think, okay, well, we've ruled out post-renal proteinuria. Um, and uh, so then the UPC is pretty much all coming from the kidney. Now this could be a little bit of kidney and a little bit of bladder um, because of the active sediment. Who knows? I, I guess, am I saying that right, George and Jelly and Astrid? Well, <laughs> UPC is six. Is, 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 yeah, uh, there has to be a glomerular is, component in my mind. Is, yeah, there's a glomerular is, component. In a perfect world, you you might, if just taking those data by themselves, you'd clean up the the inflammation and recheck the UPC, but we got a dog with hypoalbuminemia right. and a creatinine or two. So, yeah. you know, um, we maybe shouldn't be terribly patient with this dog's problem, you know? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. And even though the white cells are, are definitely increased, it's not, you know, too numerous to count white cells. Oh, okay. The UPC could easily be six and, and just be to do, do post renal. This is one where I would be less. Uh, concerned about the post renal contribution, even though I'm sure it's contributing some. Yeah, I think that that's like whenever we work, when I work with my residents, especially so my first year residents that are on this phone call, um, and we talk about, and you guys consult with me on kidneys, and I want to know all the information from the kidney disease, I want to know all these ClinPath parameters. And so that's one of the things that we'll ask, talk about is the is the the sediment analysis, and it's not just knowing what the dipstick showed, right? Um, and so that's why I, I do a lot of follow-up questions when we're talking about that. Okay, so I'm going to minimize this because, or get, stop sharing this because I want to show you the pictures now. One other point about yep. that UA is that your specific gravity is 1050, 1050. Yeah, he can still concentrate. So, so you know, uh, that if it be if it's ten fifteen and there's seventeen white cells, you know that's, that's a different story. So. Yeah, that's a good point, and and it can be really a variable. We can't really truly predict what post renal proteinuria will contribute, um, so it's all uh, a bit of a guess. Okay, so let me share this now. So um, for okay, so then for our new um, internal medicine residents and my new um, first year uh, residents as well. 
Um, what happens is when we get the biopsy, we process it, um, and the first thing that I get out is um, from the um, histo lab is the H and E slide because it's just going to go with our regular kidney or sorry regular biopsy tissue. So it's always the first thing that I look at is the H and E slide, and I don't usually at this stage get the special stains until a couple of days later. But so what you're seeing is is basically my order of how how I see things. Um, and so this was a really good specimen. Let's see how many gloms he got. Uh, he got 26 gloms on his specimen. Um, and, uh, and then five of them were globally sclerotic. So globally sclerotic glomeruli have no open capillary loops. And for the pathology residents, they can just basically assume that they're not gonna be filtering anything. Um, everything is just gonna be um, shunted past those glomeruli. Um, so the ones that are open are the ones that we look at because the globally sclerotic ones are kind of, you know, um, it probably happened in SCARD a while ago. Um, and so they don't often give us a lot of information. We just we just report their percentage. Um, so in this, my first sentence was there's 26 glomeruli, five of which are globally sclerotic. Now this one is not globally sclerotic because we still hopefully, and you guys hopefully can see my arrow, my cursor. Um, there are open patent capillary loops. And for the brand new pathology residents, the reason this can be um, frustrating for you guys is that I get to see gorgeous kidney biopsy tissue and then when you guys are on autopsy rotation you guys give me autolyzed tissue and I can't I can't see anything so uh, part of it is just because the biopsy quality is uh, the, the quality of the viable tissue is so good um, as opposed to rotten rotten kidney so this part is open so hopefully everybody can see we have open capillary loops um, and then um, we have some area here where the capillary loops are not open so this used to be part of a glomerular tuft and the we've lost our capillary lumens and then we have this huge broad adhesion between the tuft itself and um, Bowman's capsule and so that's what we call a synechia. Um, so we have some segmental scarring and um, the other thing that we can call this lesion instead of using the word scarring is sclerosis because technically those are synonyms ish kind of um, at least when we're talking about the glomerulus and so we have segmental scarring and then we have this adhesion or the synechia between the tuft and bowman's capsule so that was one of the glomeruli one example of the glomeruli i saw um, we had this other one that actually um, was a little torn. This is probably just an um, artifact of the microtome. Um, but I got a little concerned because it started to look hypercellular. So um, for glomerular tufts that are cut from biopsy tissue, so these are cut at a thinner section than maybe autopsy tissue. So our autopsy tissue in our lab is cut at four microns, and these are cut at three. Um, and um, they uh these these glomeruli should have basically one maybe two endothelial cells that we can see in the lumen um the other thing that it should have is only two to three mesangial cells and mesangial cells are going to be these guys that, that are at base of the capillary so this will be easier for us to assess when we're looking at the PAS slide because that's a lot easier for us to assess that but i get this feeling that the glomerulus looks a little bit um hypercellular um, and then um, again, we had kind of maybe a little bit of hypercellularity in the mesangial zones, and then maybe a little bit of kind of glassy material within the um, mesangial matrix. So, um, and then oftentimes when I'm seeing kind of um, glomerulo, glomerular disease lesions, whether it's glomerulonephritis or not really itis, we do get a lot of kind of um, circulating or peripheral um, inflammatory cells just kind of hovering around glomeruli, and that's, that's pretty common. Um, so I think I texted JD and said, I'm not really sure what's going on. It might be immune complexes. It might not be. Um, but uh, there's definitely scarring and there's definitely already like, sclerosis at this point. Um, hopefully you guys can see that this little guy, he's a neutrophil nucleus because he's a little ropey guy. That one might be either a mesangial cell or whatever, but we, we kind of have the feeling that we've got some maybe um, polymorphonuclear cells um, circulating through the tuft. Um, I'm going to skip forward to the PS. Okay, so the state I like to look at um, for assessing cellularity, and if I'm going too fast, hopefully people will tell me to repeat something on the chat. I haven't seen anything pop up on the chat recently. So um, so this is the same first glomerulus I showed you. <laughs> um, my lab is getting a little annoying because they're not being perfectionists like they used to be. So they used to always have every single serial section in the same orientation and whatever, and now they're, they're not doing that. So I'm a, little, I'm a little frustrated, but this glomerulus is the same one I showed you from the first, it's just flipped around. 
I can't, I, I'm a diva. I can't, I can't help it. I want my glomeruli to all look the same. Okay, so here's our sclerotic portion, that same sclerotic portion with that adhesion. So that's what it looks like at the PAS. And then here's our capillary loops that are open. So this part is segmentally affected. And then these guys are open. And the key for glomerular basement membrane thickness is that there is the glomerular basement membrane here, and it should be the same thickness or thinner than a tubular basement membrane that's from a fairly normal tubule. Like here's a fairly normal tubule, and that looks fairly similar. Um, this is not strikingly thicker than that tubular basement membrane. Um, here is the other glomerulus that I thought started to look a little hypercellular. And um, as I said, you can have one endothelial cell in a capillary loop, like that's just one, so that's fine. There is one, that's fine. Um, but the mesangial component, so this is all mesangial matrix, should be limited to two to three nuclei. And I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I see quite a few mesangial cells. Um, and so there is a hypercellularity component to this. Um, it seems to be more in the mesangial compartment than maybe in the circulation compartment, the endo endocapillary. And then um, again, a little bit of mesangial hypercellularity. Um, and this is that same glomerulus that had some fluid that was being pushed into the capillary wall. So we call that lesion hyalinosis. And what will happen is as you cut through glomeruli and you're looking at different levels, um, uh, you sometimes all of a sudden see, oh my gosh, there's even an adhesion here, which we didn't really capture that on the H&E slide, but we have an adhesion on the PAS because it's a, a deeper level of the section. So that's the PAS. We have this, um, this uh, feeling that there's hypercellularity, although it doesn't seem to be a lot of circulating inflammatory cells. Um, the trichrome um, gave us that same picture. We have segmental scar. Now we're kind of almost like cutting out of that glomerulus. That's why it looks a lot smaller. Um, Again, mesangial hypercellularity, I didn't see um, any evidence that there were maybe immune complexes at all. I was pretty, pretty sure that there was just a mesangial hypercellularity. And again, mesangial hypercellularity. I wasn't, yeah, I, I'm not really that impressed. The, the, I, do say, I do think the podocytes look a little bit hypertrophied, but it's hard to, it's hard to tell that. Um, the other thing I'll use the trichrome for is to look at interstitial fibrosis, and so there is a tiny bit there, so there might be some chronicity um, to this disease, but it's not severely scarred tubular interstitium. And then my last stain is the silver, um, and so when I'm looking at the silver, hopefully you guys can see these capillary walls right here at this periphery. Um, they seem to be very smooth, which is um, normal, so they have a normal smooth capillary wall. Um, Again, here we have an adhesion, here we have an adhesion. It's very easy to see with the silver stain, but when we can see a capillary wall, it looks like it has a smooth cortex, or sorry, smooth contour is the word I'm looking for. And, um, okay, and then that kind of same broad adhesion in that one glomerulus. So that was my preliminary is that I have um, segmental sclerosis and I have some degree of mesangial hypercellularity and it's, it's, it was pretty consistent um, and it was um, concerning for proliferation. So um, usually when I have that, um, I um, am concerned and I will put a morphologic diagnosis of proliferative, which means the mesangial cells have proliferated, um, proliferative and sclerosing because there is segmental scarring, um, glomerulonephritis, or sorry, glomerulopathy is usually what I'll say. Um, and so I'll be kind of conf I'll be kind of um, open and frank with the with the clinician that like I see stuff and it's it's wrong, but I don't necessarily know are immune complexes driving this or is this just a um, is this just a, a podocyte driven disease? Like maybe the podocytes are really angry and that's why we have segmental scar. Um, and it's just very difficult to try to figure out what the cause is. And that's why we need uh, additional studies. So I don't really have a problem with when, when I need to say I have to look at the EM or the immunofluorescence because um, that, you know, that's what makes my job interesting. So let me just pull up the EM really quick. Let's see. And honestly, I haven't reviewed these EMs for a moment, so I apologize. Hmm, I'll just do these. And now I need to share that part. Okay, so I go to the EM scope, I don't know, a couple days later, and uh, I immediately text Dr. Foster and said, ah, 
I know the diagnosis. <laughs> so um, let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see that there's a capillary loop in front of you. Um, and, uh, and so the, we, I, I, you know, when I'm at the EM scope, I take a lot of images and then we kind of pick and choose which ones are going to go into the report. So, um, but pretty much at that early, um, early stage of just kind of finding the glomerulus, I could already see that here is our capillary lumen. Okay, so here's the cell that's lining the capillary lumen. And if that's a cell that's lining the capillary lumen, Dr. Lind or Dr. Miller, what type of cell would that be? You have to unmute yourself, hopefully, or put it in the chat. What type of cell would that be that's lining the capillary lumen? This is a very easy, I'm not trying to- It would be endothelial cell. Yeah. <laughs> and oftentimes when I'm writing a report, just to be clear, I'll say glomerular endothelial cell. So that, that defines it as, I'm talking about the glomerulus, I'm not talking about a peritubular capillary endothelial cell. So the glomerular endothelial cells have very specific um, features. Do you know what any of the specific feature that the endothelial cell has in the glomerulus? And it's okay if you don't. I'm getting probably a no. Yeah, nothing's coming to my mind. I do okay. not. <laughs> okay. Um, do any, Dr. Wong, do you know what's fun and exciting about the glomerular endothelial cell? You might not be able to speak. Sometimes you can't speak, but maybe you can put it in the chat. Maybe, maybe. Actually, I'm not seeing where my... So if she's up there and she's able to put it in the chat. Um, so the cool thing about endothelial cells in the glomerulus is they're fenestrated. So they have these tiny little pinpoint holes that are going tr like transcellularly from the surface, the luminal surface, all the way down to the base of the cell. And they have, so think about a colander, um, maybe like that you're draining pasta. That's what it looks like, all these pinpoint holes all through the cytoplasm. And so that is the fenestrations. The other really cool thing about glomerular endothelial cells is they make a really cool matrix and we call it the glycocalyx. And so the glycocalyx would be sitting on the surface. And if you would think about a whole bunch of like meshwork, it looks like sagebrush, like from a, a Western film, if you look at it, um, and that would sit on the surface. Now a regular transmission electron microscopy um, prep degrades and gets rid of the glycocalyx. So I can't see it. So I'm doing an electron microscope and I can't see that glycocalyx. I just assume it's there if, I really was interested in glycocalyx and there are some diseases in humans that we know are, and, and some animal models that we know are glycocalyx dependent. Then we actually have to do a different type of preparation of the sample. And then basically you don't really see as good um, resolution of the capillary, but you see that, that sagebrush mesh work all over the place and it's really cool. Um, so that is the, um, the, the cool two components that I know of, of the glomerular endothelial cell, the fenestrations and the, um, the glycocalyx. And then let's see if I can do this. I think I actually have to do, there you go. Okay, so we're going to a level higher mag of that same um, glomerulus and we're gonna talk about these guys pretty soon, but I do wanna point out if we have a higher mag, I do wanna, point out so here okay so we're at high mag I know I'm I know I'm beating this but I don't think you guys mind right this is fun okay so here's these cells Fo focus on these cells and we're going to get to high mag of those cells okay so here's those same nuclei and then for the pathologists and you know medicine residents these little blebs here right there right there right there are all the little fragments of endothelial cell cytoplasm. So when we have a section through a cell, we grab a little bit of cytoplasm and then that right there, that tiny little space is the fen fenestra, fen fen fenestra. <laughs> and then we go back to more cytoplasm. So this thing would be encircled in a three dimensional component, but right now we cut right through that middle of that fenestra. And so that's why we see that gap. And you can kind of catch these gaps in other places. So this endothelial cell is maintaining in its fenestra. Um, and I think actually this is the endothelial cell and I think this is probably a, a different cell. I can tell just based on where it's located in the, the capillary wall, but this is the endothelial cell. And so he's able to maintain his fenestra. So he's probably not too upset um, because he's still maintaining his regular shape. Any questions about the glomerular endothelial cell? 
Um, okay, so now let's go back to the elephant in the room, and that's this huge electron dense, irregularly shaped, variably sized material. And this is definitively diagnostic for immune complexes. I have never seen anything else different, or and never seen anything else cause this type of uh, material. Even deposits that are made solely of complement proteins, and those are complement deposits, and we see those in some pigs, and we see that in dense deposit disease in humans, they look different than this. So I don't even think that this could be complement deposits. These have to be um, immune complex deposits. And so you can see these guys are, or these guys um, have been laid down. And then what happens is as these deposits are present, the um, <coughs> Podocyte, who is right here, um, doesn't want to touch the deposits. So when I teach this to the vet students, um, I make it. Up, I make up a story because you know stories are easier to remember. So they're basically think about it like a month ago. This deposit and this podocyte were in direct contact with one another, and they were hanging out. And the podocyte did not want to be there. So the podocyte's trying to block or wall off that deposit, sit as far away from the deposit as it possibly can. And so what it does is start to lay down new matrix of the glomerular base membrane. So in general, the endothelial cell on one side and the podocyte on the other side um, are sitting next to each other and they're synthesizing matrix that's going to be the glomerular base membrane. And um, so they have the capability to lay down new material. And this one is laying down new base membrane all over here. And these, this podocyte, which actually is maybe the same podocyte, I mean, he's laid down tons of matrix. And so he's basically creating these huge projections that are keeping him away from the deposits down here. So, um, uh, and again, we're high mag now. We're, here's podocyte, here's lumen. Um, and here's endothelial cell, so we already looked at this picture, but you can see this new matrix that's basically encircling the deposit. It was a little like kind of strange that I thought, why didn't I see this degree of remodeling on the silver stain? Because usually you can pick up some remodeling like this on the silver stain. Um, I went back to that silver stain and it was a little faint. So I do think that the, the deposits, I, I think if we restain the, the silver stain maybe a lot darker, I could have picked out some of these tiny holes, but you know, um, at least I could get them a diagnosis via EM. So, okay, so there's that. Um, okay, so then we have also deposits not only on the outside surface. So this is outside surface. We already went through this, this is endothelial cell. So this is luminal. Um, so what we'll talk about is anything that happens on this side is, you know, that's right here next to the endothelial cell, we'll call that subendothelial. And then anything that's out here by the podocyte, we say is, instead of saying subpodocytic, which would make a lot more sense, we say subepithelial because the podocytes are an epithelial cell. Um, and so here we have a different capillary loop. And so here's our podocytes. And I'll go through with you guys really quickly how I can quickly recognize that. Maybe you guys can quickly recognize it on your own. So here are podocytes. And then instead of having deposits out here by them, they're actually on the inside. And so they're right below those endothelial cells. And you guys can see the fenestra. See how there's little dibs, uh, dit dots of cytoplasm? So each of those little dit dots is um, uh, the clear space is the fenestra. So we have deposits also um, on the luminal side of the capillary wall as opposed to the epithelial side of the capillary wall. And then this is a good example um, of what pretty much normal foot processes should look like. So um, they are perpendicular to the lamina densa and they are a whole bunch of them. They should be regularly spaced. Sometimes they twist and turn, that's fine. Um, and then eventually, even though you don't always get the right section, eventually you can see that there is a connection between the foot process and the cytoplasm of the actual podocytes, like the body of the podocyte. So um, this one, it does connect, I promise you, it would connect, but it's just not connected in this particular very thin section. Are there any questions? I feel like I've talked a lot and I'm wondering if anybody can hear anything I'm saying. Actually, one of the things to remember is that adjacent foot processes are actually uh, set different cells. Yeah. So if the, these they are actually them. interdigitating. So if this one is connect, if that one is connected to that particular uh, cytoplasmic body, the other one next to it is connected to something else. 
So, and then this is the, the nucleus and, and the main body of a podocyte right over there. So, um, so I was pretty confident that we had, um, okay, so, so I, I, I wasn't, I knew that we had electron dense deposits and this was mostly going to be immune complexes. Um, the other thing we commented on is that if we go back to here, you can see good foot processes. But the reason we have good processes with this podocyte is because he's not touching any um, immune complexes. The immune complexes are all the way on the other side of the glomerular base membrane. So he has no interaction with those immune complexes. He doesn't care. He's just going to maintain his life. Whereas these guys, again, had deposits. They walled them off. And then they went crazy. And they were like, I hate life. I'm just going to give up. And I'm not going to have those foot processes. Those foot processes to maintain them is very energy demanding. It's a very complex process because you have like all these uh, action filaments that are basically um, the, the main part of that foot process. So what they do is they, we, we talk about um, effacement um, of those foot processes. So basically what used to be foot processes over here have been lost and the whole basic, like the, 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 entire portion of that podocyte just basically adheres or sticks to the glomerular base membrane. The other thing that they can do, which I think is illustrated here, is that when podocytes are angry and they've lost their foot processes and they're just not happy with life, what happens is they'll oftentimes decide, I need to make, I don't know why, but they make these little villous projections towards I guess urinary space, wherever they want, basically. And so we often joke, it's like they're trying to make foot processes, they're just doing it in the wrong way. They're like not, they're not even focusing on those little, like they're not even focusing on where the glomerular base membrane is. They're basically just saying, I know I've got to make these little extensions, um, but I'm just going to make them. It doesn't really matter if they ever match up with the glomerular base membrane. So um, that's pretty much the same um, loss of foot processes. Um, and these little microvillus extensions just going off the podocyte surface. Um, this is a capillary, and um, this is actually not a capillary, apologies. This is an arterial um, that uh, has um, uh, a kind of degeneration of the smooth muscle cells. So there was some arterial or damage as well um, with this case. And then, and I feel bad because JD is still not here and I hope he's alive now. I hope he wasn't like running to go somewhere that was um, uh, available. And we had so many people, um, Shelly, when Dr. Baden, when you guys get ready to do your online teaching, I swear there would be times I would look out into the class because, you know, we had like 40 students and some of them would be driving. <laughs> and I was like, why are you driving? <laughs> Why are you zooming in while you drive? That is not a good idea. We've okay. had some interesting stories from the faculty as to what the students have been doing while they've been in class. So that we've set a new guidelines of appropriate behavior for being in class online. <laughs> that is a good idea. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, now I'm going to share with you guys the IF. So um, the immunofluorescence, um, what we do is we stain the um, um, tissue with um, FITC. So FITC is a green immunofluorescence dye. And we stain the tissue um, with uh, antibodies directed at various immunoglobulins. And they are, some of them are canine specific and some of them actually are human antibodies, or I guess I should say, um, fluorescent antibodies directed against human proteins, but they do cross-react very well with canine proteins. So, um, so we kind of use a mix, um, but we've been doing it for since 2005 or 2007 or something. Um, and so we're pretty confident that we can interpret the results accurately. So this is a glomerular tuft. And then every little dit dot here, hopefully you guys can see, is an immune complex that contains IgG. So our fluorescent antibody against canine, canine IgG, IgG is, is adhering and sticking to those little dit dots. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of patchy, but you can see it throughout the tuft. Um, and so when I look at these, I have to look at them in a dark room and I'm using a fluorescence microscope and the pictures are never, like, they're good, but they're never pristine. Like the, looking through the microscope is how you should score things. So I usually, I score through the microscope, but then I take a picture for the report. So that's IgG. IgM actually had no um, staining um, as opposed to IgG was pretty prominent. Um, IgA was segmentally traced there. So C3 is going to show activation of the complement system. 
Um, and uh, the, so every single dit dot is an immune complex that is activating complement. So all those um, electron dense materials that were um, that we identified on the electron microscopy has IgG in it and then there is K9C3 sitting next to that deposit that is basically the complement system being activated by an antigen antibody complex. So the antigen antibody complex is there and then the C3 in circulation is like oh I'm really really angry and I'm going to get activated and then I'm going to activate the complement system all the way through to the membrane attack complex, all of those components get activated. And the problem is that when you activate C3 or when you activate the complement system and it's really close to the podocyte, podocytes don't like that. So that's why in this pattern of immune complex deposition where a lot of the deposits are um, beneath the podocyte, you get a lot of scarring because you've injured your glomerulus and you injured the podocyte. And so that's why you see that segmental scarring, which is what we picked up on in the histology. And this area here might be a segmental scar in this glomerulus that was taken for immunofluorescence. Um, and then lambda light chains. So light chains are also a part of the immunoglobulin. The IgG is the heavy chain, um, and there's two possible light chains that are made, um, the kappa and lambda. Now in humans, um, I'm, I, although it's been so long since I've been at UNC, um, kappa I think is 60% uh, and lambda is 30% or 40% of um, human uh, immunoglobulins might have that reverse, but I think I'm right. But the, there is expression of kappa light chains and expression of light, lambda light chains. Um, and they all work together and then they'll um, take part of the heavy chain, whether it's IgM, whether it's the mu, mu heavy chain, the gamma heavy chain, the alpha heavy chain, whatever. And they take part of that and then they form the immunoglobulin. But in dogs and in cats, we see very little production of kappa light chains. Um, so there is some literature, because somebody probably did it for a PhD project, where they looked at lymph nodes, and they didn't do the same thing that we do. They didn't do immunofluorescence, but they looked at lymph nodes and they realized that dogs and cats make mostly lambda. It's somewhere on the order of like 90% of their light chain production is lambda, and 10, five to 10% is kappa. Um, and then I think pigs are a little bit more evenly balanced, although I'd have to, to recheck that as well. So, so for, for our purposes, we only really need to do lambda because that's the only one that's going to be in these immunoglobulins. And that's what this is. And like I said, there are some, this is one of the ones that actually is a immunofluorescent antibody against lambda light chain. It's actually against human lambda light chain, but it's so amazing because it cross reacts with feline and canine lambda light chain. So we get really good staining and then we can correlate it, right? We can say, well, we know we have positive lambda light chain and we know we have electron dense deposits. Those two fit together. If there were a scenario where we had a lot of electron dense deposits and this never stained, then we would think this antibody is not very good. But we always have a way to double check ourselves. Are both of them there in the same case? And if so, then we feel confident that we're getting a good answer. So here's our glomerulus lambda light chain. Um, so we got diagnosed uh, immune complex GN. Um, let's see, I will share really quick the final diagnosis report. If I have it still. I Can I quickly oh, yeah. uh, ask a question in between? Yes. Um, what do you think causes the immunoglobulins to either stay on the endothelial side or to cruise through to the epithelial side? And That's then do, do you see differences in, for instance, your immunofluorescence? That, that will help. Uh... Okay, that's a really good question. So I can answer the, the, the second question a little bit easier. So um, I, I don't trust the IF to tell me because they're basically going to be dit dots, whether it's subendothelial or below the podocyte, so subepithelial. I'm still just going to see dit dots. Um, a perfect membranous case, so when, when it's always just gorgeous deposits on the subepithelial surface, that is usually really, really strong. And so if I'm doing the IF first, I'll be like, I think it's going to be membranous. And also, I also have the supporting thing from the histology is that they don't usually have a lot of hypercellularity, membranous cases do. But I don't trust the IF to say where the deposits are located. Um, I, might, I might have a mental note, but I don't necessarily um, make that call until I do the EM. Now your but first I, question. I, um, oh. I mean, I meant. Um, do you see differences in positivity for IgG, IgM, or the complement involvement, or the 
uh, love that chain. Uh, no, I do not see a difference um, that the only one that is uh, probably different is that if it's mostly in the mesangium and not in the capillary loops, um, I often can see um, more IgA in those cases. Um, dogs and cats don't get IgA glomerulonephritis like humans do, but they can have a little bit more positivity. I, I've had a few random cases where I'm like, this looks like a classic IgA, and that's usually mesangial located. Um, but the human uh, immunofluorescence world is awesome because IgA is what drives mesangial, mesangial proliferative disease. Um, but we don't really have that same kind of distinction about which one's positive and which type of disease it is. And, and so in humans, they just call it IgA nephropathy. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. The first question from whenever, like, where do, why, do, why do some deposits decide to say, but need the endothelial cells? Why do some of them go all the way to the protocyte cells? So there's a couple of answers to that. So, um, and, and we're, again, assuming a lot from based on what we know in human medicine. So in human medicine, we have what used to be called idiopathic um, uh, membranous. And what that would be is uh, only deposits right beneath the podocytes, and they would be like pretty discreet, and they would be like almost the same size all the way across every single capillary loop. And you would have remodeling, and the podocyte didn't want to touch it, et cetera, et cetera. You activate complement. So that used to be just idiopathic because we didn't know why they were doing that. Um, and then you had another type of membranous, which was kind of similar, but you could say, oh my gosh, this patient also has cancer. And so that, those immune complexes are probably based on the fact that there's circulating cancer antigens. Um, and so that was what, call, what was called secondary, and that was a different treatment. You treat the cancer, and then hopefully the membranous goes away. Um, but idiopathic, we didn't know what the cause was. We just immunosuppressed. So um, then they found the antigen, and they know the antigen is actually on the podocyte. So for some of the cases where membranous is, all the deposits are right next to the podocyte, we assume that the antigen is podocytic. And so for some of our classic dog membranous cases, I don't know what the antigen is. We looked to see if it was the same antigen that they know in humans. In humans, it's the PLA2R. Um, we haven't seen good um, correlation, so, um, but it might be another antigen. There's plenty of, they actually just published another set of antigens for idiopathic membranous in humans. So maybe it's that antigen. Maybe that's the one that drives it in um, podocytes. So that's the, the membranous one. The ones where in this case where we have some, some subendothelial and some subepithelial, um, the way I remember I was at a talk with Dr. Jeanette and I liked the way he described it. We put it like very, very clearly. He's just like, Antigen and antibodies, when they meet together, they don't always just stay together, right? They have some degree of affinity for each other, and it might be very tight affinity, and they may not ever like to let go of each other. And in those scenarios, they probably can't go further than in through that fenestra, and then they get stuck because they can't go through the lamina densa. But you have other antigen antibody complexes that are occasionally like, meh, go, I don't care. And so when they have that ability to be two separate proteins, they can transverse the GBM, and then they can end up into subpodocytic sub space. And so they sit there, and then another one comes along and sits there, and another one comes along and sits there. And then from starting with a two-molecule interaction, it can be a huge, large interaction. And then complement comes there. So we add complement into the mix. So that part of it might be when you have that both components of subendothelial and subepithelial. I think it sounds interesting. Yeah. Yep. Um, Hopefully, I mean, I, I haven't heard anything other than, um, than, than that theory, just that it's an easy to explain theory, and so I guess that's why, that's the way I try to teach it. Okay, so I said, uh, and, that, and so this is actually what, what uh, uh, the other pathologist and I who read for this, oh, I don't know, you guys see that word mix, that's what I'm trying to highlight. Um, so uh, what will happen is we have some cases where every single deposit is right beneath the podocyte, and that's that what I talked about, her classic membranous. Um, and so membranous being only the membrane seems to be affected. And that's the terminology we use in human medicine. So that's why we use it in veterinary medicine. Um, now we had in this particular case, some, a, a good number of deposits that were below the endothelial cells and they hadn't gone all the way out to the um, epithelial side. And that's why we add the word mixed for this. 
Um, we did this so that someday when I have, I don't get sabbatical apparently because clinical track never gets sabbatical. But if I ever have time to do more research, uh, we wanted to see if these guys with the mixed pattern would behave differently than the guys that are just straight membranous. And we can have a mixed pattern, which is more membranoproliferative as well. And so that would be deposits like we saw everywhere. And then in, in addition to being um, uh, deposits, there's also going to be a lot of circulating inflammatory cells and a lot of hypercellularity within the capillary lumens. So that would be what we, what we call a mixed membrane proliferative. I've gone for 50 minutes and I feel like we just got started. So I apologize. I, ram I ramble. Okay. Um, those are our pictures and uh, interpretation when we, oh, sorry, that's up at the top. Uh, so we knew that there was, I, I even said, here's my thing. <laughs> um, I, actually, I'm glad I said this because this is exactly, I, I have not reviewed this case before I started around, so I did not really know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm honest. It's a difficult case. I couldn't tell based on histology what it was going to be. Um, so I would need to see that. And like I said, I was a little uh, frustrated that our Jones didn't show the remodeling. But then when I went back after looking at the EM, the Jones was fairly lightly stained. And I think if I had it restained, I might be able to catch that remodeling. But that's just the, 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 name of the, the nature of the game. And then Dr. McLeland, who is our um, contract pathologist, often is able to help me read EMs. Um, and so she was able to show that there were uh, deposits. She just kind of commented on the presence of deposits. So um, mixed membrane proliferative. And I'm not sure sure uh, if it uh, doesn't seem like JD got here to see what happened with the case. I do know I can bring up, um, hopefully, uh, Dr. Hocamp, are you still here? Have I talked too long? Can I show your SDS page? Yeah, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly well. Sorry, I'm um, on my residence thing. And you wanna see my real cool mask that I get to wear down here? Oh, do I have to share? Oh, yes. look at that duckbill mask. That's real attractive. <laughs> Wait, which one is it? The duckbill mask. Oh, fancy. It gives okay. me a lot of breathing room. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hide my face again. Okay. Um, so I can't scroll down because you've got it, but um, this- You ready to go to the gel? Yeah, if you want to go to the gel. So it was, it's interesting. So this was interesting as well for me. So um, for those who are new to these rounds, so when we get biopsies, um, I would say in about a third of the cases, we get urine samples and sometimes serum and plasma submitted as well. And the urine samples, we do a complete urinalysis on them. And then I run a, a urine SDS page, um, so basically gel electrophoresis on the urine sample. And we have uh, demonstrated correlations with the severity of glomerular and tubular damage. So if we have predominantly um, bands and particularly heavy bands above um, about the 60 uh, kilodalton mark. So if you're getting up into that high molecular weight category, um, we are, you know, that's consistent with um, glomerular damage or primary or predominantly glomerular damage. If you have predominantly bands um, below about 40 kilodalton, so in that low molecular weight region, um, then you are concerned about primary tubular damage or predominantly tubular damage. So in this case, this is as, um, you know, correlated very well with the severity of damage that um, Dr. Cianciolo found on biopsy with it being predominantly glomerular damage, very mild evidence of tubular damage. And in fact, in many of these cases with marked glomerular damage, usually some of these proteins that are down in the low molecular weight molecular weight region are probably overflow proteins um, that just basically there's too many proteins um, being presented to the tubules to be reabsorbed. Um, but the ma vast majority of the proteins are high molecular weight. What was interesting to me is that usually with a focal uh, so FSGS, sorry, my words aren't coming out well, but focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, um, global glomerular sclerosis, and with like a pure membranous glomerulonephritis, 
usually the banding pattern, yes, it's predominantly glomerular, but usually the bands don't really start to creep up over about 160 to 200 kilodaltons. And in this case, we did have a few bands and particularly the one that's at um, above 200 kilodaltons was actually, it's, it's very hard to see on this scan, but if you looked at the gel, it was actually a pretty prominent band. It was really easy to see. And so that was interesting to me when I went and looked back at Dr. C's um, uh, biopsy report <laughs> that I, are you laughing that I called you Dr. C? Rachel's biopsy report um, that this was a mixed membranous. And my presumption is that there's actually quite a bit more damage than we would, or, or maybe um, diffuse damage than we would potentially normally see with um, just a pure membranous glomerulonephritis. And that's why I presume that that band is there. But again, we're always wanting to evaluate more of these um, in conjunction with a biopsy. We do not charge for uh, extra for these SDS page evaluations. Um, if you submit urine sample with um, biopsy and this report, um, we'll, you know, we'll try to get it out within short order. Um, but it's really helpful for us to get a better idea of what patterns are typical for different diseases. And this has been very helpful for us when um, an owner cannot do a biopsy. There have certainly been some cases where we are strongly concerned based on the SDS page only that this is ICGN. For example, the case that's right to the left of that um, lane in the blue box, box, so the one that's, yeah, right there, that one is classic to me for uh, a membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis based on that heavy, heavy band, yeah, um, at approximately 160 kilodaltons. And again, it's hard for you to see them, but there's actually several bands above 200 kilodaltons. They're, they're faint on this scan, but they were pretty visible on the gel. So that's what I want to say about this, but it was also interesting on the gel and just another plug to send us pee. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also, um, which we've said a lot of times um, for a lot of clinicians who use this routinely, um, is that also, you know, if you send tissue, this is done as an additional test and it is not um, an extra charge by any shape or means. Um, this is something that doctor, uh, we consider still investigative, so we do it uh, at no charge. You can just send this and not send tissue, and then we do charge for that because that is um, actually we we usually have to do those in very short order. Um, whereas this, we can kind of we can kind of uh, batch what's it. Called? batch these. Yeah, we can batch yeah. process these. But if it's something like where you know you can't do a biopsy, but you really need to know is you know could, do we have any suspicion for um, glomerular proteinuria, and then also do we have any suspicion for immunocomplex? deposition, then um, Dr. Hocamp usually does those like the next day or the day after. So, so we do have to charge for that. Um, but anyway, so point being is that also if you've submitted a sample and then you want to go back and just send us urine, like maybe a month later, hey, has anything changed on the gel? Um, we can process those um, again at no charge. So right. as long as we know what the original histology diagnosis or the comprehensive biopsy diagnosis is, and we have that documented in our system, then um, we consider the urine time point and any post time point to be um, additional material for our research. Yep. I said that right, didn't I? Yeah, that is accurate. Okay, so yeah, so um, I apologize, we're right at one, so I do want to end. Um, I apologize that Dr. Foster was not able to join. Um, I think I did okay with the clinical part, we'll see. I don't know how he treated, so I will follow up with him to see how this dog is doing, and then I'll just do a reply all to the invite, just to, or maybe have him give a reply all to the invite so that we know what, what he decided to treat with, um, and then how this dog is doing. I thought he was doing well, but um, I, I hope so. I might, I might be confusing if he says this is a lot of biases. Do you guys have any questions in general? We have a chat question. Oh, it's just a thank you so much. Um, if there's any other questions or comments or concerns, um, please let us know. And, uh, um, you know, I can ramble on about the kidney forever. So uh, happy to do so. Um, and then hopefully the timing will work in the future as well um, for uh, more people to participate. Okay. Well, I don't have any questions. Nobody's questioning me. So, okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you as well uh, for me. Thank okay, good. Much. I'm glad you were able to call in. So yeah. thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank